Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Nine to Side podcast, where we chat with super amazing and inspirational people who pounded the pavement before and after their nine to fives to get their side hustles off the ground. After listening to the interviews with these amazing guests, you'll walk away with a refreshed pep in your step and a newfound motivation to make your side hustle a reality. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode two of season two of the Night Aside podcast. I'm Alexander Faust, your host. And I'm just thinking here as I'm recording, it's like the end of summer, and my kids are all in camp, and they come home with all these arts and crafts that they do, most of which I throw out. Don't judge me, but they come home with stuff every single day. So I really have to weed stuff out, or it just gets to be too much. I'm not that cruel, but honestly, if it has glitter on it, garbage. If it has like macaroni on it, garbage. But the things that I do love that I don't throw out, are these bracelets that they bring home. They've gotten really into making like gimp bracelets this summer and some string bracelets with beads and stuff, which I love. And it makes me so nostalgic for my childhood because I have such great memories of going to the bead shop and like filling my little box with different color beads and having the string and just sitting there for hours making bead bracelets. And it was so much fun. I I don't know. It brought me so much joy. And I think about it now and I'm like, why don't I do that as an adult? Because I was helping one of my kids sort of finished their bracelet they brought home. And I was like, this is the most relaxing. It's so calming. I feel like it's very zen to focus on something, pick out colors. It's just, I don't know, it really calmed me down. I'm like, I should really bring this back as an adult. So anyway, it is brings me great joy to talk to people who do this kind of thing for a living. So my next guest, April Soderstrom, she's a jewelry designer and she does this for a living. She had a, always had a love for jewelry, bangles, bracelets, like the whole deal. And so I think it was always something she was interested in. And then she started, you know, making jewelry and doing this, started it as kind of a side hustle and then now is doing it as her full-time career. And she's got celebrities wearing her jewelry. She's been dubbed the Bay State Glitterati, which I absolutely love by the Boston Herald. I love that title, the Bay State Glitterati. I think that's so fun. So she's just uh, such a great example, too, of somebody who worked really hard. It did not happen overnight. And I think that's really important to hear her story because it helps sort of demystify what is what looks like a super successful business that people might be like, oh my gosh, that seems impossible. She's super talented and made that happen. No, she worked on it for years and years before it became what it is today. So talking to her, she kind of breaks down that whole path and you know what brought her to where she is today. So I hope you enjoy the interview with April Soderstrom. Welcome, April Soderstrom. Thanks so much for joining. Appreciate you being here. Before we get started, I wanted to and get into your background and hear about a little bit about you. Give us a quick elevator pitch of your business to tell us what it is and then let us know if it is a side hustle for you right now or if it is your full-time career. All right. I'm April Soderstrom and my business is a jewelry business and I sell, manufacture, create, design my own jewelry collection. And the whole idea is it's just kind of Somebody emailed me today and said, it's like getting a box of happiness whenever they order from me. So that was the perfect way to describe my jewelry. I, I like to design things that are colorful and lively, and it is my full-time gig now. That's great. Cool. Well, I personally have experienced the joy of the box of happiness because I ordered one of your bracelets that was the donation for yep. Ukraine. And I loved, I loved the packaging. I loved getting it. It was amazing. So walk us back, give us a quick background of who yeah. you are, where you're from, and then we'll get into how you came up with this idea, sort of where it came from and how you got started. Yeah. So I'm originally from Michigan. I live in Wellesley now, just right outside of Boston. And I moved to Boston after college in 2006 for a job in interior design. Uh, that's actually what my degree's in, in interior design with a minor in entrepreneurship. I started doing mostly commercial design, huge office spaces for Bank of America, you know, 50,000 square foot of cubicles and some fun restaurant projects and that sort of thing. And then in 2009, the economy 
slowed, jobs started to kind of dry up. And one of my favorite clients heard through the grapevine I was slow. And he had been trying to get me to be his assistant for years. He goes, I heard you're slow. And he's like, do you want to be my assistant? I'm like, all right, you get two years. I'll give you two years and then I'm out. And I stayed with him for seven years as an executive assistant. And um, I I had kind of realized like interior design on paper was what I liked. But in reality, it wasn't the job for me. Um, It was too slow. I'm a bit of a control freak. And you design something and then the client's like, but I want it exactly like this. And that's completely different. And that's great for some people. But my artistic kind of vibe is I I like to be able to control the design a lot more than I was allowed to as entry-level interior designer. And also, I like quick projects. Interior designing, you could work on the same project for a year, two years, three years. And it's different in other areas where you can make something in five minutes, you can make something in an hour. But while I was working as an executive assistant, you know, I learned so much about how businesses work. And so I got to kind of sit in on like massive meetings and understand contracts and everything like that. Um, But creatively, I didn't get to do much. So I kind of started my jewelry business in 2012 while I was working as his executive assistant as a side hustle. So was there thought during this time, like in the seven years, not doing interior design for large like businesses, but maybe tapping into interior design for residential or doing like, had you thought about that yeah. at all? I did some projects, you know, he knew me as an interior designer. So I took on a couple side projects while I was working for him in interior design. I was just kind of over it. I mean, I still love interior design, but I don't want to do it. I have no regrets about getting my bachelor's degree in interior design because oddly enough, I still use it today. I learned so much in college about how to present your ideas, how to put together design packages for your client, um, everything like that, that I still do today for my jewelry business. In your background, you talk about like always being into jewelry and stuff. So talk me through like the initial idea, the thought, like what was the first thing? Were you like, I need to get back to that? You just started messing around with jewelry? How did that start? It was kind of a strange turn of events, I guess. I randomly off of a a somewhat intoxicated dare decided to run for Miss Massachusetts. And it was kind of one of my friends was like, you should run for Miss Massachusetts. And I was like, never would I ever. And then the other guy was like, she'd lose anyway. And I'm like, well, it's on now. (laughs) Okay, now you're on. And randomly I made like jewelry for my interview outfit and that sort of thing. And I met someone, she won, obviously, I did not. So you just got into this pageant, did you have to, you just entered yourself and just, I know nothing about the pageant world. It's wild, but I feel like once you've done a pageant, like, I'm not scared of anything. And so the girl who won the first year I competed, her and I ended up becoming really good friends. She ended up getting a job in jewelry PR. And I was always making jewelry just for myself, just for fun. And she kept saying, she's like, April, she's like, I sell jewelry for clients. And your stuff is is better than a lot of the things I'm selling. And she's like, you got to get a website up. And I'm like, all right. So I think it was 2012. I put up a little website, barely anything. Uh, In my interior design degree, I actually like really played off that because people would email me photos of their dresses. And then I would come back with a full design board with sketches and everything saying like, this is what I'm going to do for you. And because, you know, they're all over the country and they could print out my design, cut it out of paper, hold it up. And that's kind of how it started. Uh, Very slow. There was no big boom. I would have been surprised if I got five orders in a month. I'd be like, who are you? <laughs> so was this before, was this at, like Etsy, like a lot of people do stuff on Etsy, but you were selling it direct through your website. Did Etsy even exist? In- Etsy. No, Etsy was, there. Um, Etsy was there. I made a conscious decision in the beginning, which I'm really glad I did for me, for how my business runs now is that I, I wasn't going to do Etsy. I think I put up an Etsy, Etsy shop but I put a couple things up and I think it scared me in the beginning of how big it is and the lack of kind of control or 
it was kind of nice when I first started to know that nobody was even looking at my website. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> you know, like if you put it on Etsy, you're like, I don't know. Are there thousands of people looking at it right now? I have no idea. And right. it's kind of like I started AprilSoderstrom.com and no one is stumbling across AprilSoderstrom.com. <laughs> And you're doing this on the side. You're you're working your yeah. nine to five. It's great. You're doing this. You had no kids at this time. So no you're just kids. making um, jewelry and your free time and doing custom pieces that you're putting up. Or are you taking orders? I was and taking requests? orders for custom pieces. Okay. And then I had a line of these earrings I started off with called the Featherweight Collection that are wire earrings, super lightweight. And they're still one of my best selling items. Why did you come up with like those earrings and they're hype. They're what gold fill? They're or? 14 karat gold fill and sterling silver. So they're really high quality without the price tag, really. I made them mostly for myself. I loved wearing hoop earrings. I hate heavy earrings. So I just, I bought a, an ounce of gold fill wire and just started messing around with it and bending it around various cosmetic tops and things like that to see what shapes I could get and hammering it in different shapes. That's still kind of how I work today. Um, There's nothing on the website that I wouldn't wear. And I try and maintain that. So I think that's kind of how I started. And I still, even though it's on a a much bigger scale now, um, still kind of how I function design-wise. How did you take that step from it just being this small website to the featherweight earrings, which you said really put you on the map to yeah. talk me through that. A little jump. transition. Yeah. The jump so from it being more. Of a, yeah. So, business. I mean, it started out just kind of a fun thing for me. I like making jewelry. So to put a few hundred bucks into materials, if they never sold, I didn't care because I would have bought this stuff anyway. So I kind of started out pretty much with like a big shoe box under my couch. And then eventually the couch under the couch got filled with too many supplies. And then I moved to the dining room table. And so I was just like slowly kind of taking over parts of my apartment. But this is over a matter of a couple of years. How are you getting customers? Like, how did you start to build Instagram your client was, base? Instagram was there. Um, it was mostly through word of mouth, through kind of the pageant jewelry thing. And then my friend Lacey got me a few press spots. Um, So she got me in a couple magazines and they were super helpful in term, more in terms of just clout than anything Mm -hmm. else. Cause you're, you know, I remember, I think I, one of the first ones I had it bracelets on the cover of fitness magazine. And I'm like, well, (laughs) all over here, get ready to quit my job. I didn't sell a single bracelet. Really? You have no idea if these things are going to hit. But you hearing that my jewelry was on the cover of Fitness Magazine is impressive. You know what I mean? Yes. And you're like, oh, wow, I'd like to look at that. How did you sort of evolve what you were creating? in, In like 2012 to 2016, the business was really driven by the featherweight collection. I had a couple things that kind of boosted things too, where I got a few big wholesale clients and a few of my biggest wholesale clients have come from my clients. They own my earrings and they work for, you know, whatever company. And so they pitch me before they're like, hi, I'm reaching out. I bought these earrings three years ago. And I've, I've talked to my boss or whatever. Wow. Blue fly, uh, blue fly was back, back in the day. Yeah. So I got on blue fly and I got on a, a website called joyous. That's no longer around. And so I got these things through clients. Um, so you weren't actively, I was going to ask if you took any kind of marketing training or obviously you have business background and you have a degree in entrepreneurship, but like these people just came to you in terms right. of the wholesale and pitched you on that because yeah. they loved your product. Were you I, actively? No, no, I didn't actively. I mean, it kind of did. I, I, I was available and I worked hard to make it. If something came in and they were like, we need, I think I had an opportunity to have earrings on E News, one of their like sale things, and they needed a thousand pairs of earrings. And I'm like, all right, I've never done that before. But it was also if they didn't sell, I had to take them back. And for me to absorb that much inventory at that time was huge. That was one of the few times I think I kind of went out on a limb and was like, all right, we're just gonna we're gonna dive in and see if this goes. And they sold. 
which was great. How do you do that with the, um, when you went from the shift to being just kind of, I don't know, a few orders coming into taking on, cause like a lot of people also say that it's like when it goes from being a hobby where I don't know, or a, just a small side hustle when people are ordering to somebody placing an order for a thousand yeah. and it was just you. And then there were more of those that came along. Did you start hiring people after that or? I hired my first full-time employee in 2020. That was the year kind of the, the roof blew off things. So, you know, 2016, I quit my job, but I spent, you know, four years kind of slow growing just a little bit every year. 2018, I had my first son and oddly enough, business really started growing after that. And I don't know if it was like timing social media wise or just, I was sharing more on social media. And I think I was before that I was keeping my social media very like business focused. I think I was behaving as April Soderstrom, the brand so much more than April Soderstrom, the person. And once I had a kid, I incorporated it and it was showing that I'm, you know, mother of a young kid with my business and the juggling of that. I think it became relatable. And so business like started to grow from there. And I hired a new ad company to do Instagram ads, social media ads in 2019. Do you feel like feel a, that made a big difference? Because I it made a huge difference. Early 2020 was like the wild, wild west of like right. you know the targeted ads and things like that. I get it, privacy settings, but business wise, I think a lot of people you know really did amazing with that. But right when COVID hit, early in March, I believe or February, I'd started a collection of name game bracelets. I call them. Um, they're everywhere now, but I think I was one of the first to kind of start doing those. And at a time when people aren't allowed to be with their loved ones, um, it was a special thing to kind of buy and wear on your wrist. How do you keep up and scale that and keep like your prices down too? Because I think what I love about you is your prices are very reasonable. It's touch and go at times because I'm always like, oh, we can do that. But it doesn't mean that we should do it. But I found some of my best designs or some of my inspiration from these projects, from someone coming and saying, you know, I want to do bracelets for the Red Sox, you know, for a team, a sports team. So I hate to turn down ideas if I'm interested in it. If it's a project that I'm like, "Hmm, all right, I'm down to make that. Um, Amanda, who I hired in 2020, still works with me. And so we just kind of quickly put our heads together. I feel like we've also... I've done so much of it that I can do things quickly. So back to the interior design thing, I'm really good at presenting. So if somebody emails me from California and is like, I'm interested in this kind of a thing with this color, it's not going to take me hours to kind of quickly put together a quick image board on Photoshop and say, is this what you're looking for? And I feel like I can really spell out my designs before producing them really well to save me time and give the client to be able to look at it and say, yes, or no, I want it with this, that, and the other thing. I was going to ask about your sourcing because I love the quality of, I mean, just from this one brace that I got, but the quality of your beads, where do you source those? And then do you go to all different places? Do you have like one? Yeah, I go everywhere. So do you Um, go in person to touch the, like to see the beads? No. Or is it all online? I used to. I used to go into bead stores. That's what I did in the beginning. And so my margins in the beginning were pretty low because I was purchasing from a bead store where there are they've already marked it up 5X or whatever. Do you expand it where you've got a place where you do all the making of your products? When we were in Boston, I actually rented the apartment underneath us and moved in there. It it worked out amazing because I was working out of our spare bedroom in our apartment. Um, The apartment underneath us opened up and I'm like, we're going to soak that up. And so I moved down there and and then COVID hit. Both my husband and I were working at home. So we were kind of just up and down, up and down, up and down, like who, who got to work in the office downstairs. And then we moved out to the suburbs and redesigned the house we purchased. And so I built a huge studio in that, which is you know, good and bad. I like being home and here for my kids. How has having kids shifted, you know, how you manage 
this business and what you're able to do? What, how have you had to sh- change? Things? It's funny. The woman who works with me is amazing and we work so closely together, but like, I, I think one, like Levi, my, my five month old was born on a Wednesday, I think. And I was home from the hospital on Thursday and Amanda had a close cat contact COVID case. So literally she couldn't come into work on Monday and we had it so planned out that like I was going to at least take a week off to like recuperate. Oh yeah. You and don't get maternity leave when you work your own, when you have your own business. No. <laughs> and this was, Levi was born November 16th. So we're in Black Friday land. And so she's like my roommate, I think it was a roommate had, someone had COVID that she had a close cut. Like it, she couldn't come in because right. I just had a baby. and. I was like wearing the infant, trying to process orders. My husband's sticking labels. I'm like trying to recline in the chair just to give gravity oh some help. Those moments that, you know, you would never want to do it if it wasn't your own business. But I try and realize like how amazing this all is too, even when it's stressful and I've got bouncy seat behind me in the office. He has his workstations. So I would imagine that would be so difficult if you're in a creative space or you're on getting yeah, into it's, something. <laughs> it's going to change next week, whatever yes. it is. Um, some people are like, you can slow down your business right now because you had a baby. But also I feel like I'm at this pivotal point where like I started to skyrocket in 2020. And if I slow it down, I'm going to lose out. If I'm either not good at something or not efficient at something, give it to somebody else. There's plenty of things I can do. It -hmm. doesn't mean I should be doing them. I have a business advisor whose wife found me on Instagram and she reached out and she's like, my husband actually advises businesses and, you know, I love your company. Would you be open to talking to him? And I'm like, this is the best sales pitch. He said to me once, which I try and like, think about this all the time. And he's like, if I were to hire you to design jewelry for me, he goes, I'd pay you a thousand dollars an hour or more because that's what your time's worth designing jewelry. He goes, if I'm going to hire you to stick shipping labels, I'm going to pay you $15 an hour that's today, so tomorrow. He's like, that's not what your value is. You could be amazing at it, but that's still what like you're better at something else. So I've been trying to kind of lean on the people I've already hired to do more, even if it means I make less. I can still maintain my company now without as much stress. I think what you just said is so helpful. And for anyone listening is so, I was, I think women too are used to doing so much. I mean, people, yeah. And and for anyone, women, men who have their own business doing all the stuff, I think that's the biggest thing, but that's so smart what you said. And so well put, I've never heard it kind of yeah. said exactly like that, but it, it stuck with me when it, it when really, that. that will stick with me. That's such a good way to think about it because it's so true and you do have limited time. So I, I think that's just right. like really smart, such a great lesson. And it's me. kind of, you know, if I don't have the time and this was, you know, I think this was in 2020 when I hadn't hired anybody and I'm like, well, I'm doing okay. I can, I can do it all. I'm working till 11. I'm making a ton of money with all these orders coming in. And he's like, but you're not making anything new because you don't have time to. And that's where your value is to design something that's the next big seller. And so I'm trying to outsource a little bit more. For so long, I did everything. I did the accounting. I did um, most of the website work, all the photography, everything like that. And so now I've started to outsource. Now that I've gotten a little bit bigger, you know, in the beginning, you got to do everything. Um, right. But once you've kind of figured out like, yeah, I can do this, but I'm not that efic- efficient at it, or I'm not even that good at it, spend the money. So like, one thing I started doing recently is I've started having pretty big photo shoots, um, hiring models and that sort of thing. I still do all of my own product photography. So all of the like white background images and that sort of thing, I still handle because I'm very particular about being a certain way, being a certain look. And also production wise, if I design a product now, I could have it on my website tomorrow Yeah. versus if I have to hire a photographer. But I've stopped trying to create the glamorous editorial type photos myself because I'm not good at it. Yeah. It's hard. 
um, I can get a great photo of bracelets on my wrist, but like but not, head, yeah. no. So, that's, um, yeah, I think that's really, that that's really smart to, to outsource those things and then focus on the things that you're good at. I mean, right. in terms of like what your, you know, your collection and what you're doing now, is there anything that big that you would, that you regret doing that really like a huge setback or has it kind of just been like a slow upward climb where you've learned along the way? Or have you had any major setbacks? I don't think there's, I've been super conservative, probably to a fault. So I don't think, unfortunately, but also fortunately, I really didn't take any risks. I mean, I quitting my full-time job was a risk, but I quit my full-time job when I probably could have quit my full-time job a year, maybe two years before. Right. You know, I think I, I'll work to the point that I'm like, okay, I can't possibly do anymore. I have to quit my full-time job. And I'm already making a good enough salary with my side hustle that I probably should have done it a year ago. Which is a great, I I mean, I think you're a great example too of for somebody listening who's like, oh my gosh, she started making jewelry and then it became this hugely successful brand. That's not not how reality is and what you did. So you, I think breaking down the steps is, and it's taken you a long time to get to where you are. And- And I think a lot of, there's plenty of ways to start a business, but I feel like now, nowadays, and I might be just old school, like everybody's like, well, you got to get investors. And it's like, what do you need an investor for? You don't even, you know, not every company needs huge amount of investment. You don't even know a lot of times, especially with product-based businesses and that kind of thing, like mine, you don't know yet. I feel like if, if you're able to start out slow, that's okay. Plus if you're, you know, 25 26, when I started, if I would have blown up in two years, what would I be doing now? The journey is so important. Like I feel so confident now because I know I understand, you know, my margins. I understand the accounting. I understand the website so that if I, I understand photography so that also when I hire people, I can manage my own expectations of their deliverables because I've done it. I've done my own books. I've, worked on the website. So I understand somebody's, their fees and that sort of thing, whether it's in line with what it should be, because I know how long things take. And if you never do it yourself, you don't know. You don't know, which is good. I mean, I, part of the thing, like in wrapping up and kind of in closing, I like to ask people, which you've already given some really great tips, but you know, other tips for people, because like I said, I think listening to your story is great. There are a lot of people who are doing like product-based kind of stuff or think that they it's a hobby right now and maybe they'd like to take it a little further. You know, any other advice you'd have for people who might have something similar, whether it's jewelry or something else that they create, yeah. they're looking to take to the next level? I think obviously give it time. And um, one thing that happened recently with me and you're wearing the bracelet now is, this is a little cheesy, but if your heart's involved in something, people see that and they, you know, respect your product. They respect your brand more early in, in March when the Ukraine war is all over the TV. I mean, I was very postpartum, but on top of it, yeah. depressed and sick, oh, yeah. sick seeing all, all this horrible news. And I felt so weird being like, Hey, everybody check out my jewelry, buy my jewelry. And I felt almost paralyzed. Like, to just like continue on business when horrible things are happening. And so I was talking with Amanda and I'm like, maybe I'll launch a bracelet and give hundred percent of the proceeds to this local charity called Sunflower Peace. I'm like, all right, on top of it, I'll do 30% of my sales for a few weeks. Then people will see that I'm, you know, that I care that I'm trying. I sold a couple thousand bracelets in a week. And yeah. since then I've been able to donate $75,000 to this is- charity. Incredible. And I noticed that's a big part of your brand is giving back like the, yeah, I've found that I like to help, but if I can't be there in person or also it's kind of like what we talked about before, where's my skills at? My skills are at making and designing jewelry. So if I can make and design jewelry in a way that benefits causes that I care about, it adds so much value to my quote unquote work. If you can incorporate that into whatever your business is on whatever scale, it's just so much rewarding. The Good Vibes, we started doing that right when COVID hit and people were out of jobs. And I think I saw an ad or something for Feeding America and looked up that charity and the 
the amount of meals they can provide with small amounts of money is amazing. And so we started donating a percentage of every sale of a good vibes bracelet to Feeding America and still do that now. I run the company and the cool part about that is I can make these decisions so quickly. There's always somebody that's going to say that, but what I loved about your, is it sunflowers for Pete? What was the? the, the it's to Ukraine with love to and, the, and it love. benefits the charity sunflower piece. Sunflower piece. What I thought was really, because there are so many, I think people get really overwhelmed with and paralyzed with not knowing how to help or what to do. Yeah. And so I think what's great about a brand like yours, that is a one, like you said, it is weird. Like, do you want to be buying things when there's so many bad things going on in the yeah. world, but to buy your bracelet, which I feel like I love it and I love wearing it. And then to see you like actually write the check and see where it's going yeah. and know that it's going to that charity, like makes me feel directly connected like that. You know, there is, because sometimes when you give money to places, you, you don't, you don't, you, know, you, you don't, don't know. know. Yeah. You don't know. Ha- having a connection is so great, especially with internet businesses nowadays. And I've gotten so many amazing messages and clients from doing something good and it feels great. Yeah. And I think you're just talking to you and, and even it comes out in your personality on, you know, online when you see your social media, but you are just such a very like real, true to who you are person. Uh And I I think that's a really important thing, like this day and age too, like people buy what they like feel connected to. So yeah. you're authentic and they're buying like your brand because they love what you design, but they're also buying like you and who you are and your authenticity. And that's what I was really attracted to about your brand. And oh, uh, thank you. So, yeah. I think people realizing share that you're imperfect. It is so nice and so refreshing to see and to hear people who are struggling with the same things. Like you're a mom, you're a mom of two boys. You're running this business. You're aspirational, but you're also relatable. And those are two things that I think are really appealing to really anyone. And I love, I mean, inspiring to talk to you. So lastly, I have two more things and then done just really quickly to wrap up because I know I don't want to take any more of your time, but where do you see, like, you've got these different collections you've got, you've got all these different jewelry that you offer, and you're obviously doing a lot of giving back on your site. What is next for your brand and where do you see, you know, yourself in the next couple of years? Where do you want to take the company? I think recently I did a um, collaboration with Mac Cosmetics and that was so fun. Um, They sent out an influencer box for new mascara and included a stack of bracelets with it. And um, I want to kind of partner more with companies and brands that I respect and love myself. Um, It's really fun design wise too. So along with that kind of growing the collaboration side of the business, versus going like heavy wholesale. Like I'm never going to have a shop. I don't ever want to have a retail shop. I'm sorry. But I want to collaborate with other businesses that I really love. Um, Doing more fun projects that my heart's involved in. Um, It gets me up in the morning, energizes me to just go, go, go. So those two things are kind of, kind of my focus for the next few years, I think. I love that. Well, I love your brand. I love all the design and the jewelry and the stuff you have to offer. So just in closing, I want to say thank you again for coming. Just tell everybody your website where they can find you, social media, all that good stuff. Yeah. So website is my name. It's aprilsoderstrom.com and Instagram. Most of my stuff is on Instagram and that's at April Soderstrom and Facebook is at April Soderstrom Jewelry. Well, thank you so much again. That was so nice. 